Hi, everybody. I'm Elizabeth Wilson. I'm the director of the Irving Institute for Energy and Society and a professor in environmental studies here. And I wanted to welcome you all to a panel that we've been anticipating all term long, um, Empowering Energy Innovation in New Hampshire, Moving from Theory to Reality. And this, this transformation from how things work in theory to how things work in practice is something that we're really interested in exploring more fully. We have lots of models that show how the world will work, but in reality, it's a lot harder. And today, I'm so excited to, to it, it, have three wonderful people on the panel. Tom Burek, who's an 82, um, who is a shareholder at Shanfinian Bass and Green, and a former commissioner of the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. He's also here on campus this term as the 2019 Perkins Bass Distinguished Visitor. Um, next, we have Henry Herndon, who is the Director of Local Energy Solutions for Clean Energy New Hampshire. And finally, a personal favorite of mine, my colleague April Salas, who is the Director of the Rever Center at the, at the Tuck School for Business, and with us, part of the Dartmouth Energy Collaborative. We're trying to encourage co-curricular programming across campus, so us at the Irving Institute, the Sustainability Office, and the, the um, Rever Center at Tuck and, and with Thayer as well, working to really provide innovative and interesting programming. So with that, I'll turn it over to Tom, and I encourage you all to give a little bit more of your backstory as, as you give your comments, and thank you very much, everybody, for coming. We're really pleased to have you here. And eat some more cheese, please. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us here this afternoon, and we're looking forward to a fun hour and a half with all of you. Again, my name is Tom Burak, and you will both hear from me as a panelist, and I will also serve as your moderator here today. We will spend the, the first half or so of, the, of, this, of this session uh, sharing some ideas and thoughts with you, and then really hope to have uh, a very open and, and constructive conversation with all of you, knowing that here in the audience there are many people who know at least as much about this subject as, as any of us who are sitting up here do. So this should be, this should be a great conversation. Uh, and on that note, I just want to ask, uh, you will now know just a little bit about us. We'd like to know a little bit about all of you. How many of you work in business, in a business? Any? A few of you? Okay. How many of you work in a municipality? How many of you work in a business called my home? <laughs> How many of you consider yourself to be full-time students? Excellent. And how many of you consider yourself to be lifetime learners? <laughs> uh, there we go, a full show of hands. Okay, we now, we now know this audience. A great, a great mix, a great diverse group. Uh, a few quick uh, just matters of logistics here. Uh, if you uh, do have a cell phone, I would ask you please to uh, mute it or turn it off or throw it away, whatever, whatever suits you. My wife would like me to get rid of mine permanently. If you need to use restrooms, out the door and to your left. Uh, we have our, our, our film man, uh, Jay, here, our sound man, Colin. When we do get around to questions, we're going to ask that everybody please use one of the microphones. So if you have a question, please wait to start speaking until the mic is in your hand. That's so that not just everybody here in the room can hear you, but because we are recording this session for posterity, and it's going to help those in the future to, to better know what happened here if we all speak into the microphones. So you're probably wondering what brought this interesting cast of characters together. What is it that unites the three of us that would cause us to, us to be here as a panel? And, and the short answer is, what's on the screen? Uh, there's an organization here in New Hampshire that started about 15 years ago called New Hampshire Sustainable Energy Association, which was really a group of folks uh, who were individual citizens and from, from municipalities who had a real interest in finding ways to change our energy thinking, our energy approach here in the state. And that started about 15 years ago, a, a nascent organization that grew over time uh, and attracted a parallel group known as the Clean Tech Council uh, roughly five years ago that began to bring folks from industry and, and business into the conversation uh, in a more fulsome manner. And just this past year, we brought those two organizations fully together under one name of Clean Energy New Hampshire, which is really an organization that's intended to help 
foment and, and bring constructive uh, progress in bringing clean energy and clean energy thinking to, to the state and really to the world. And as it turns out, April and I, uh, late last year, both joined the board and Henry is a staff member uh, of the organization that currently has some five staff members. And uh, by the way, students, uh, they're looking for interns. So if, you, if, you, if you're looking for an intern opportunity, talk to Henry afterwards, okay? Let's uh, flip to the next slide here. I guess I need to do that. Whoops. There we go. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about who we are as Clean Energy New Hampshire. We'll Set the context here, Henry will do that for us. I'm gonna provide some examples of things going on as will April and Henry. Uh, and then we wanna open it up for a discussion. So a little more about who Clean Energy New Hampshire is. Again, really three spheres of focus. One around what's going on with business, one around policy development here in the state, and another around the work of municipalities. What's happening on the ground in towns and cities across the state as they are seeking to bring clean energy to their citizens and really uh, to their, to their ratepayers. Uh, there's been some great advocacy work done by uh, Clean Energy New Hampshire. Uh, as individual uh, citizens, by the way, you can join the organization and you will get a very good uh, weekly newsletter online telling you what's been happening in the legislature that week and, and, and the, the progress or not that's being made. Uh, but also a lot of uh, just good support work for businesses that are trying to learn from each other, ways to be able to be more efficient in their use of energy and to bring renewable energy in. In fact, what you will find, sorry, is that the, the, the growth of the organization has been quite extraordinary. Uh, some some threefold growth from roughly 40 or 50 members just a few years ago to over 130 business members now, which I think is really indicative of the expanding market and interest in working in this arena. And at the same time, for the first time this year, uh, Clean Energy New Hampshire has a new category of municipal members and very pleased that there are two local, local municipalities, including Hanover, our, who's, uh, on whose uh, hallowed ground we, we, we sit today, as well as the, uh, the, the nearby town of Lebanon uh, are both members. But in fact, if, you, if your eyesight were good enough to be able to read uh, all of these, uh, uh, the names of these towns, you would see that they are from all over the state. And of course, the hope of the organization is that with time, that list will grow to communities, uh, uh, all 234 being involved uh, in this work. But the good news, and, and Henry will talk more about this later, the good news is that there are many communities across the state that now have uh, community uh, energy committees that are working very hard and diligently uh, to try to find ways to, to green their energy paths and to reduce uh, their, their, their tax burden at the same time. With that, Henry, anything you want to add about uh, clean energy New Hampshire? I think that's very well said. There, there you go, he's training a new board member here. <laughs> We're gonna turn things over to Henry to, to set the context for us, where we are in this energy transition as we are moving from a world of, of fossil fuels that, that have been powering our, our growth in our societies to a world in which we are really looking and thinking very differently about how we're going to power our future. Henry. Thank you, Tom. I'm going to stand up, if that's all right. Um, and yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about the context and sort of set the stage of where we are today. And again, Henry Herndon, I'm employed by Clean Energy New Hampshire. Tom talked a little bit about those three spheres where we're involved in, in policy at the state level, both legislatively and in regulatory policy at the Public Utility Commission, business and industry, and then the third sphere being municipalities. And that's really my role with the organization is being a resource to cities and towns around the state, helping them connect with other resources, learn about how they can implement clean energy solutions, network with one another, and also trying to translate their leadership and their sort of demand for clean energy into state policy at, at the state level. <clears throat> so sort of broad context of where, where are we today? Where is New Hampshire and where is the world? Um, I like to think of this energy transition that we're all experiencing in sort of three large trends sort of feeding together 
and combining to, to bring about this energy transition. So one, we're moving from a monopolistic energy system to a more competitive energy marketplace. And this is an important one. So our energy infrastructure owned, maintained, and operated by uh, state-sanctioned monopolies, monopoly industries that um, operate under very close state regulation. <clears throat> and um, because of that, it's, it's not you know, a free and competitive marketplace, and it's very unique, and it has a lot of regulatory burden associated with that. But what we're seeing over the past 10 years, 15 years or so, is a shift from that monopolistic energy system towards a more competitive marketplace. Lots of new emerging technologies, lots of new businesses, those business members you saw on the previous slide here in the state of New Hampshire, really entering into this monopolistic marketplace and offering customers directly solutions, distributed energy resource solutions. Things like rooftop solar and more emerging technologies. We'll talk a little bit about energy storage and some other things like that. So shift from monopolistic to competitive is one. And then closely associated with that from a centralized energy system to a distributed energy system or from an energy system that is, again, large centralized fossil fuel generators transmitting, generating power and transmitting it one direction to the end user, to the customer. Moving from that to this more distributed system with many small generators out, on the system, out across the grid, any individual homeowner, business, municipality, should have, should have muted my phone, excuse me. <clears throat> any business, municipality, any customer can now become an energy generator and feed that energy into the grid. And that's associated with the shift from monopolist to competitive. And then third, carbon intensive to low carbon, all part of this sort of same overarching trend. And these, these trends, they're raising a lot of new questions, raising a lot of new issues, a lot of policy challenges associated with energy efficiency, distributed generation, which uh, is largely solar, um, and other, other new technologies, energy storage, electric vehicles, things like that. <clears throat> so as part of this transition, energy efficiency, we like to think of energy efficiency as the first fuel. And um, what this graph, what this slide is showing is how New England, in many ways, is a leader in terms of energy efficiency policy and energy efficiency investment. So New England states, the six New England states have invested $4.9 billion in energy efficiency between 2011 and 2016. And those same states are projected to invest an additional $10.5 billion from 2019 to 2027. <clears throat> so really strong leadership in the region. But as you can see on this slide, New Hampshire, we're kind of lagging behind in terms of New England. So whereas some of our neighbors are ranked number one, number three, number four, number five in terms of energy efficiency, New Hampshire is ranked 21st. So there's, there's investment in efficiency, but uh, there could be more leadership there. When I talk about energy efficiency, also, we're talking about um, modern lighting, LEDs, modern heating systems, building envelope, anything that you can do to implement in a building to reduce energy consumption and achieve the same outcome, essentially. So after energy efficiency comes renewable energy. This slide is showing the renewable energy targets in the six New England states. And um, these are all under the renewable portfolio standards. These are sort of cornerstone state policies setting renewable energy targets over time. <clears throat> Again, as you can see, New Hampshire, we've got some targets, but a sort of lackluster. And uh, there's room to bolster those renewable energy targets. We're at the goal now is 25% by 2025, and there's actually some bills in the legislature that would bolster those targets and expand them beyond 2025, and we can talk more about that. But these, these are some of the key policies that are really driving some of the energy, the renewable energy growth here in New England. <clears throat> and what does that look like in terms of a market? So these are just some examples. This is an example from the solar industry, and what you see here is in 2010, the total number of net metering solar PV systems in the state was 546, which is about two megawatts. That's just nine years ago. And then in 2017, that number jumps from 500 and change up to 7,277. So nearly 3,000% growth in solar over the past seven years in New Hampshire alone, up to about 70 megawatts. So again, those businesses you saw on the first slide, they're busy. They're very active, and there's a really high demand for this particular technology. 
again, the high growth, see very significant growth, but still makes up a very small percentage of our overall generation mix. So competitive distributed markets for solar, they're growing. And um, this is just a headline from uh, an article, 2018, summer of 2018. It says, distributed solar saved ISO New England consumers $20 million during July heat wave. So this is an, an important point that I want to focus on. Um, excuse me. So distributed solar, there's, there's a fair amount of misinformation on this point, so that's, that's why I want to pause here for a second. So distributed solar saved consumers $20 million during a July heat wave. And the reason for this is something called load reduction. So when you have distributed generation out on the grid, you're producing energy that's less energy that needs to be generated centrally and transmitted across to the end use customer. This is an especially valuable service on the most expensive days of the year. So peak days, hot summer days, everyone's AC is blasting away, the grid is stressed out, we're at maximum capacity, that's when the grid is most expensive. That also happens to be when distributed energy resources are being utilized. They're producing energy and they're reducing the overall need for centralized power generation. So they're reducing the overall costs on the system. So this is a valuable service that distributed solar and other distributed energy resources, including energy efficiency, provide. They're reducing overall costs. This is a, a graph that is sort of hitting home the same point. This is, again, from the independent system operator, the regional grid operator. Top orange line we're looking at here, this is what the overall load would be, the overall demand on the overall electric grid without solar, without energy efficiency. Below that is showing how solar is actually reducing that load, reducing that overall peak and reducing costs. And then the blue line at the bottom is showing how uh, solar plus energy efficiency is really bringing that down. So these resources, energy efficiency, distributed solar, they're reducing load and they're reducing cost for the electric system. Valuable service. New Hampshire has what I, what I like to refer to as a, a transmission problem. <coughs> I'm going to take a, take a sip of my water here. And he's not talking about the transmission in his car either. Right. So high voltage transmission lines. These are the big power lines you see on the highway. This is a, a significant portion of all of our electric bill, is transmission. Transmission costs, they're shared across all six New England states. <clears throat> and they're based upon each state's usage of the transmission grid, particularly the monthly peak usage. So what you see in the top graph is showing how <clears throat> five of the six New England states, they're reducing their reliance on transmission. They're reducing their monthly transmission peaks. They're bringing down their transmission costs. And they're doing this by investing in things like energy efficiency, investing in distributed solar, investing in things that are bringing down the overall peak and bringing down overall transmission costs on a month-to-month -month basis. One New England state, New Hampshire, is projected to have an increasing transmission peak, an increasing transmission costs. And that's because New Hampshire is lagging behind in terms of solar, energy efficiency, and some other innovative technologies Lots of states are using things like energy storage to target their use of the transmission system and reduce that overall peak. <clears throat> so there's a lot of opportunity here in the state to be more, to be smarter about how we're investing in the energy system to reduce costs for everyone using distributed technologies. And this is just a, this is a graph sort of illustrating how Energy storage is one of those opportunities, and energy storage is following a similar trajectory to what we've seen in solar markets globally. So solar costs have come, come down dramatically over the past decade. Global manufacturing has scaled. Costs have come down. Deployment has expanded. Energy storage is sort of experiencing a similar phenomenon, and we can expect much more energy storage moving forward um, to provide similar services and more sort of sophisticated, targeted services in terms of investing in our electric grid and modernizing our electric grid. So this is my last context slide. This is a lot of, a lot of graphs to throw at you uh, before we get into some of the specifics of what's going on in New Hampshire. But I did want to flag this one other point. So we talked about distributed energy, but <clears throat> this is showing current um, power sector resources in the, are the left column and then 
projected over time are the right column. So I've circled these green bars in the middle, and that's showing that right now, you see on the left, wind is a relatively small portion of our grid power mix, but over the next 10 years, it is projected to expand dramatically. So this is another technology that's really been brought to market in parts of the globe. So Europe has really proven out this technology and deployed it on and offshore. And a lot of those same companies that have sort of perfected it are now very interested in investing off the coasts of New England. And um, a lot of the states here in New England are very interested in sort of clearing the way for that and uh, making way for investments in offshore wind. So something else to look out for for the next 10 years. So that's a, a rough overview of sort of some of the bigger trends we're seeing in electricity markets right now. And um, I'm going to leave it there and, and give it back to Tom, who's going to talk a little bit about state leadership and some of the actions that the state has taken. Great. Thank you, Henry. Henry promised you he wouldn't have any more charts, but I have a few. <laughs> Sorry about that. But I think it's important to provide a little bit of broader context. That is, what has driven this conversation here in New Hampshire about energy and, and talking about energy the way we are talking about it? And I invite you to go back about uh, a dozen or so years uh, to a time when here in the state we were hearing increasingly about extreme storms. We were experiencing some very significant regular storm events. We were starting to recognize that, that there was a real connection between more extreme, more severe storms and a change in climate. And I was at the time working for uh, Governor John Lynch as the commissioner of the state's Department of Environmental Services. And uh, in fact, when, when the governor asked me if I would take on that role, I told him that I thought it was extremely important that we focus time and energy looking at the climate issue because of its significance to the state, to the state's economy, to our well-being, to our way of life. And uh, the, fortunately, the, the, the governor agreed, and we in fact formed a task force that, that developed a climate action plan for the state. And I'm pleased to report to you that there were 29, 29 of us on that body. There were some 125 stakeholders who participated. We held multiple public listening sessions around the state, including one just down the road from here at the Lebanon Opera House. Curious, any of you were present at that, at that public listening session? There we go, a couple. And in fact, there's one person in the room who served on that body with me. Clifton Below, who was at the time a uh, commissioner of the Public Utilities Commission uh, and previously a uh, New Hampshire state senator. And what we learned was that it's not a matter of looking at how we consume energy and say, boy, this is the best that there is out there. And if we try to consume energy from different sources, it's going to cost us and we're going to have a, a worse lay of way of life. In fact, what we realized was, quite the contrary, that, that we can have, and we do have in the state, both a healthy environment and a strong economy. Those things go hand in hand, and in fact, we can generate energy and derive our energy from sources that allow us to have an even better quality of life. And what we came up with was a plan that's a climate action plan, but as you can see from the title, and I'm going to have to strain my eyes here a little bit, it's really a plan for New Hampshire's energy, environmental, and economic development future. And what we, what we focused on were a number of things that we could do to both spur economic growth uh, as well as create jobs and ultimately reduce the cost of responding to a, a rapidly changing uh, climate, a set of climatic conditions. So we focused on how could we reduce emissions from various sources, and we'll talk more about that shortly. How can we ensure that our natural resources particularly our forests and what limited agricultural land we have in the state can serve as a, as a permanent sink for carbon, how we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions overall, and at the same time, educate people about the importance of this work, work while we adapt to a changing climate uh, to the extent that we're not able to mitigate the harm. One of the things we looked at very early on was where were we in terms of emissions of greenhouse gases and what could we anticipate the future would look like. And so what you'll see here with the jagged lines here for non-combustion, buildings, electricity generation, and transportation, and those top three are the three principal categories, roughly 
30% each or so of emissions at the time, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, you see a jagged line of steady increases. And what we did was essentially draw lines going out from there and saying, if we don't make any changes in how we are living our lives and how we're consuming energy, we're going to be on these trajectories. We're going to end up going out this way. This is a business as usual or BAU pathway. What are we going to do to break that? Because if we can't break that trend, we're in big trouble, we concluded. And what we came to discover was, I just want to go back for a moment, I want to point out to you this peak right here. Go back, that's that peak right there. What we were afraid of is that we were going, we were going north in a hurry. In fact, and this is the good news, look what has actually happened since roughly 2000, uh, where are we, 2003, 2004, somewhere around there, uh, to overall greenhouse emissions in New Hampshire. This is New Hampshire specific. What you can see is we actually are, for the most part, on a downward trend. We saw a little bit of a blip here past few years, but now starting down again. So this is really, really good news. Of course, if you look at the national trends, you'll know nationally and internationally, things are going more or less up this way. But in New Hampshire, we have actually started to bend the curve. And that is really, really exciting news. What we determined in our task force was that we were going to need to, by the year 2050, cut our overall greenhouse gas emissions by some 80%. Um, with a, by 2025, a roughly, I think we were looking at a roughly 20 to 25% reduction, but really need to figure out how we were going to get on this glide path moving down. And we know that in the past 10 years, we've started sort of down this line, but what we've realized is that to get there, we were going to have to make reductions across buildings, electricity generation, transportation, natural resource management, in order to start to achieve those reductions. But there was also a wedge here, this bottom triangle. We didn't know how we were going to do that. We just don't, didn't know. And I would suggest that maybe we still don't know fully, but we are hoping that as we all get smarter and we develop new technology and, and new ways of approaching things, that we can also find a way, if we can implement these other measures, that we can reduce those greenhouse gas emissions as well and get permanently down on that trajectory and in that direction. We looked at what the different actions are that we could take uh, in terms of how much uh, emissions they would help us to avoid. That's on the bottom axis. And what the economic benefits would be of those actions. And what you'll see out here is some of the best ways for us to avoid emissions uh, and, and get significant economic benefits are really by looking at our buildings, both existing residential buildings, existing commercial space, and new construction. And I, we're going to think we're going to have some examples of all of those kinds of things for you in, in some measure here today. Uh, but also uh, issues with vehicles, which we won't touch on a lot today probably, uh, but, but fuel efficiency efforts uh, and, and other efforts to, to better manage and, and generate our electric energy here in, in the state. Those are the kinds of actions that, that we identified. And what we hope to share with you today are some real-world examples of how uh, this work is, in fact, getting done. And I'm going to jump in with, with the first example here. Uh, the theory was, and again, this was part of the action plan, that, that the state and municipalities could and should lead by example. Uh, because, in fact, for state government, uh, energy costs, as with all of us, go up pretty much every year. Uh, and, in fact, the state of New Hampshire is, as an entity, the largest single consumer and purchaser of energy in the state spend roughly $18 million on, on just heating the buildings, running the electricity for the buildings and all the rest. And then on top of that, uh, we used to talk about a roughly $25 million budget all told for energy, because there's probably somewhere in the range of 5 to $8 million or so for fuel for the state's roughly uh, now 2,700 vehicles. And that includes the entire fleet of DOT trucks that are out plowing the roads uh, every winter. Uh, but the state itself owns some 500 buildings and leases many more. So it's a, it's a huge, basically, landlord for itself. And what we asked is, what could we do? What could we do better? 
And around uh, 2005, uh, a, a steering committee was formed. Uh, I joined state government late 2006, uh, and, and, and I and others really pushed to get this cranked up. Uh, really, we wanted to see what would happen if we really had an, an empowered steering committee. We had staff to help us do this work. We actually invested in, in energy savings and, and how, looking at how we could creatively tap not just state dollars, because we, as, all, as we all know, the state of New Hampshire is frugal in its spending. Uh, and so the question is, how could, we, how could we tap into private energy sources to help get this done? And what could we do maybe to lengthen the uh, allowable return on investment period? For many businesses, they're looking for a return on investment of anywhere from one to three years at the outside, maybe? Sound about right for those of you in the business world? Uh, about the right range? The state of New Hampshire, until a few years ago, was willing to go as far as 10 years out and say, you know what? We're willing to invest now on the theory that over a 10-year period, we'll get a payback. We recognized uh, through this group that that wasn't going to be good enough if we wanted to make the investments necessary. We were able to convince the legislature to change that to a 20-year return on investment. Uh, we also were able to get uh, both Governor Lynch and, and Governor Hassan to sign executive orders, uh, really spurring this work on, and we did a lot of work to, to uh, track the progress. And very quickly, we, we have made progress. What you will see is that uh, measured both in terms of total energy consumption, we're on more or less a slight downward trend. In terms of total fossil fuel energy, uh, a, a slight upward trend, but now trending downward. Uh, but at the same time, notice what's happened to the total square feet of, of state buildings, actually an increase. Uh, and total energy uh, costs, however, have generally trended slightly down. Uh, and that would not have been the case but for these efforts. Uh, the way we in state government measure this is on the basis of energy use intensity. That is, how much energy does it take to heat and light uh, one a square foot of, of, uh, of office space or, or building space? And what you'll see is that we have managed to reduce uh, our overall energy intensity by some, what are we looking at here, 16 17%, something like that? If I got that right? Yeah, roughly 16%. Uh, and on a fossil fuel basis, by nearly 26%. So those are some real, uh, some real progress that's, that's being made. The challenge is that, that it's really hard to make progress without substantial dollars. But here's one example that we did in the state. Uh, this is, uh, if any of you have visited the Department of Environmental Services, uh, that's that, that, that large uh, building up there on the right. Uh, we invited uh, companies to come in and look at four facilities on Hazen Drive. Uh, that facility, the DMV building uh, next door, uh, as well as the uh, Department of uh, Safety's building, and help us identify ways that we could reduce energy. Uh, usage overall and make us a proposal and fortunately we were successful in getting a number of, uh, of proposals and ultimately selected one contractor, Con Edison. They uh, effectively made a loan to the state uh, in, in roughly this range, 12.7 million. It allowed us to build a biomass boiler, that's this building here, to provide uh, the heat for uh, this building. Uh, we also installed various kinds of improvements uh, energy control systems, uh, upgrading uh, HVAC and, and laboratory uh, hoods, uh, all kinds of energy efficiency, lights, pumps, et cetera, water conservation. Uh, and what you'll see is that project is saving the state $950,000 a year. Very significant savings, uh, but you can't do this necessarily with every project. Uh, we have done another project with Cannon Mountain, uh, which has been very, very successful, got much greater returns than, that, than they thought. So that's one example of moving from, from theory to reality. Another quick example, moving from theory to reality, uh, architects and others have long understood that if we really were smart, we could, in fact, build buildings that can create all of their own energy. Uh, it's just we haven't really applied ourselves uh, and said, yeah, we can do this. But there are a lot of good reasons why you would, uh, because, in fact, while you may spend more in the near term, you're going to save lots of dollars. And little known fact, you look at the lifetime of a building, 10% of its costs are in the construction, 90% are actually in the long-term operation costs of that building. Uh, it's an extraordinary uh, uh, ratio when you, when you think about it. So lots of reasons why you'd want to build 
uh, buildings that basically uh, can, can take care of themselves. And in fact, just down the road in West Leb, uh, Twin Pines Housing, a, an organization that provides uh, housing for low to moderate income uh, families, is doing just that with this 29 uh, unit apartment building. And uh, what you'll see is, uh, and, and these are photos I took just, uh, actually this was uh, Easter Sunday afternoon, I was just down there, that's what, that's what it looked like not too long ago. Uh, R40 insulated walls, heavily insulated roof, um, all kinds of, uh, of energy uh, efficient uh, components. There will be some 450 solar panels on the building, uh, but it's only going to use 10 to 20 percent as much energy as a comparable building. And last, a uh, very quick example of moving from, uh, from, from theory to reality, biomass moving to uh, uh, really as, as a renewable energy resource. Uh, I said May 2009, I think I meant May 2008. Now it was just earlier this year, omnibus spending bill, uh, there's a provision that recognizes the carbon neutrality of forest bioenergy and biomass as a renewable energy source. Uh, so really uh, helping to support the shift from oil and natural gas to wood chips. Uh, you can see here what the efficiencies are of, of biomass as a fuel. Interestingly, it's probably somewhat more efficient for thermal only as opposed to as combined heat and power. Uh, but, but generally, uh, for those two uses, quite efficient. Not a not terribly efficient way of generating electricity uh, using steam. But this is just one example of, of over 120 schools in New Hampshire, both public and private schools, that have installed biomass boilers in order to heat uh, their campuses and their facilities, uh, resulting in not just significant savings in the near term, but actually helping to ensure that there is a market for low-grade wood, which ensures that people here in New Hampshire will want to keep their lands as, uh, as open forest lands. So those are my examples of, of good results from uh, sustainably harvested uh, wood and, and of other efforts to try to bring a renewable clean energy to New Hampshire. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to April. Great, thank you. Hopefully that provides some um, context. So I actually moved to uh, Hanover in 2016 from the Mid-Atlantic from Washington, D.C., where I was, uh, among other roles, uh, running the State Energy Assurance Program for the Office of Electricity, Delivery, and Energy Reliability, um, also working in partnership with the Department of Energy's Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy Office, which is where a lot of the state energy uh, program funding uh, for these state energy offices comes from. Um, and so I had this example of experience on the theoretical side. We did a lot of program and grant funding and a lot of um, funding execution to other agencies that we'd partner with from American Public Power Association to Edison Electric Institute, which oversaw coordination of the investor-owned utilities, um, but also work with state agencies like uh, the National Association of State Energy Officials. So, you know, kind of serving this national need, but really from Washington, D.C., um, as I moved into the Quadrennial Energy Review and started to review the U.S. electricity system as a whole, I mean, we all talk about um, this kind of term we throw around that all implementation is local, uh, but moving here really drives home uh, this, this theory to practice. You know, when I was in the Mid-Atlantic, again, working with all states, but, you know, I, many people think of New England as one homogenous state, you know, and it's, it couldn't be further from the truth. And not only uh, that, but as you're kind of understanding some of the sub-regional um, practical constraints and opportunities, you also see within one particular state, there's variation from town to city to the next town over. And so, um, you know, and as my day job is running the Center for Energy at the business school, I spent the last three years increasingly as a, as a citizen resident of Hanover becoming more involved in everything from the Sustainable Hanover Committee to the planning board um, and looking for opportunities to apply that theoretical experience to um, some of the practical realities of actually driving implementation and change. Uh, and in the context of, of some of the, the, the practical constraints that people like you and me face in our homes when we're making uh, you know, home acquisition purchase decisions as well as things like renovations and um, just the complexities across New Hampshire uh, as I've learned even more working through Clean Energy New Hampshire and others throughout the region that, you know, energy is a large cost for many residents um, when, when they're looking at their monthly bills. 
And so there's a lot of opportunity for innovation, for evolution, but um, in particular is understanding how some of these decisions go from this theoretical concept of clean energy is good for all to some of the actual implementation practicalities. And so um, I'm here actually on behalf of Clean Energy New Hampshire as a board member, but also um, I, I took on the position mostly because of my increasing volunteer capacity as a part-time uh, municipal sustainability director for the town of Hanover. And I can't take credit for 99% of the work that we're doing. And I'm going to talk about um, who's driving a lot of this change. But I came into a really active community that, that believes in this clean energy future uh, and joined a team of, of dedicated staff <coughs> and volunteers and, uh, and helping to steer this. So um, we actually had the benefit of just having held our second annual forum for our uh, Ready for 100 vote, um, one of the biggest uh, you know, excitements that we have, and I'll talk about that in the next slide, is, is as the first um, town in the state of New Hampshire to adopt a 100% clean energy uh, target. It's a really ambitious target, and one of the things that we think about from the federal system that we bring over into the state and municipal perspective is that in many cases, unless you have a municipal cooperative, we don't, you don't own and operate the energy system. And so when you think about some of these opportunities for change and innovation, um, we kind of think about them theoretically, but then when you get to the brass tacks of uh, implementing some of these projects, you have to realize you're not the owner, you're not the asset owner, you don't make these decisions. We're all sort of consumers and we interact with um, the energy uh, sort of landscape that's, that's within our, our footprint. And so how do you think about um, changing that when you don't own that infrastructure, when you don't have that decision-making authority um, to immediately sort of you know, change from one to the other. So um, one of the big things is, is to help contextualize uh, opportunities for like town roles, uh, committee roles that um, in particular we've benefited from here in Hanover, but it's not uh, distinct to Hanover. Um, City of Lebanon has an analog and, and various other communities across New Hampshire uh, are increasingly um, uh, if they don't already have one, developing these, these committees that are volunteer-based in many cases, um, driving a lot of this change, like very much like in Hanover, um, very grassroots. You know, these are citizens demanding some of this change. There's a picture of the 100%, uh, which is part of the community campaign um, that preceded even, I think, my arrival. I have two of our co-chairs here um, who can correct me, as well as our town manager. Um, but, but a lot of this happened really at the grassroots level, and there was foundations laid before we even got to the point where we were voting. The picture in the middle is actually of, the, uh, of, of two years ago next month, I guess technically in May, um, at town meeting where we voted to adopt this, this really aggressive target, and Judy Kala standing up to, to speak on behalf of, of you know, an endorsement for this vote, which wasn't, by the way, without some conversation and, and some debate. And so... Uh, while it was an overwhelming uh, pro, and we, in, in fact, endorsed the, uh, the vote to adopt 100%, that was just the beginning of the challenge of trying to figure out, well, now what and, and where do we go from here? So as we've articulated on this slide, here are two primary roles, one of which is the town. There's a leadership opportunity for the municipal staff to play a role, and a lot of that, in our case, is directed by our town manager, our director of public works, and our director of planning and zoning. Um, I think in particular when I talk to other communities, I would say this is our secret sauce. They, you know, the town managers here and can, you know, speak to this as well. Um, but providing some of that staff capacity to support the committees that oversee these, these subject areas has been really critical to taking it from theory to practice and actual implementation. So a lot of the staff are actually participating in many of the volunteer community meetings on an ongoing basis and making them available in their staff time uh, as part of their day jobs to be able to help drive some of these uh, implementation activities. The other is the Sustainable Hanover Committee. It's an all-volunteer committee, and these are just residents who are really, really passionate about it. Um, how many are we up to, Yolanda, now? 17 full? 18. So we have 18 members. We're really fortunate. Some communities across New Hampshire have one or two. And so we see this as an opportunity to help kind of contextualize what we're doing to make it easier for other towns and communities to take it from theory to practice. 
Um, in particular, um, as I already mentioned, the staff support for our committee, but the reestablishment of the energy subcommittee has been critical after our vote two years ago. It was really about thinking, you know, how do we actually galvanize around this energy, these energy targets we've set for 2030 for electricity and 2050 for uh, electrification of, or sorry, for uh, the greening of transportation and uh, the thermal system. Um, but in particular, again, not owning the system, you know, how do we think about everything from community action to um, the establishment of, of our neighborhood action committees and trying to figure out a facilitation and a way for us to hear from the residents as well as an opportunity to think about breaking our system down um, into smaller bite-sized targets that we could start to achieve um, measurable progress each year. And so with the leadership of our committee helping to identify specific targets that we can think you know, and kind of organize the 18 members of the committee um, towards uh, each year that are, that are measurable, um, that, that are achievable, has been really, really uh, impactful. Um, one of the big distinctive qualities, I think, of what we've done um, that isn't better or worse, but it's the way that we chose, is um, we have 100%, first of all, it's community-wide. As, as we adopted this vote, and then went out into the broader ethos of other communities. Um, as we're already seeing corporations starting to think about clean energy procurement, now you have municipalities and cities getting into this. How do you think about um, setting a target? There's actually no consensus on how you measure it. So it can be an annual net. We chose a community-wide target, not just a municipal load target. Uh, many other communities are just looking at the city or municipal energy. Again, it's not to say it's bad or good, it's just a choice that we made. Um, others are looking at that, like I said, that annual net. So um, you take what you generate versus what you consume, and if it annual over the, the course of the year nets out to being green, then you've, you've achieved your target. Again, perfectly fine. What we chose is actually to, to green our electrons as much as possible. So we focused on generation. Very, very aggressive goal. Um, and we found that, you know, as we went out into the broader national community of cities and municipalities trying to, to push forth with these types of local implementation projects, um, that we were pretty unique in this respect. And that this is a really aggressive target, but an exciting one. And we thought, we, we feel like our, our size is really our, you know, our benefit. So in reality, I think, especially when I talk to young people at uh, Dartmouth or at Tuck or other academic settings, um, you think that you, know, you, you have a vote, you kind of snap your fingers and, and things happen overnight, but in reality, um, you know, we were one of the first states to uh, adopt an, um, the, the, the deregulation of the uh, generation from the transmission and distribution. So this is uh, you know, a legislation that's 21 years in the making. So fast, you know, rewind 21 years ago, something had to happen in order for us to even think about having community choice. And so we think, again, all of this didn't happen in 2016 when I got here. It certainly didn't happen in 2017 when we had the vote, but it's the foundation that was laid incrementally over time that got us to where we are. Um, so many of the Hanover people will appreciate these beautiful signs, but one is something you see on the way in to Hanover in any of the, the multiple entry, entry points, which signifies that we're one of the first green power communities in, in the state. Um, and we're really, really proud of that. But we couldn't do that without the partnership of our large energy users. As I talked about um, us defining that system um, and having a community-wide uh, approach, it means that our values are really important as a community. Understanding who those large energy users are and how we think about how we break down, especially if we're focusing on 2030 electricity system, um, Who's, who are the users of those, of, that, of those electrons and what are their specific needs? And it's not the same for everyone. So we can't really wave a wand and say, we're going to do what works best for the municipality and then apply that to the residents and the small businesses because they have different needs. Um, you know, it, this is a program that has been ongoing, again, since I think 2014 or even before that. Um, and a lot of that is in partnership with the good work that's already happening and taking account for um, you know, initiatives that, say, Dartmouth is leading or other of the large users. Um, here are some of the green power partners who have anywhere from 10 to 100% green energy and that contribute into that large user base of, of partnerships that we um, look to. Everyone from the school district who has their own, most have their own sustainability committees um, and are driving respective clean energy um, uh, 
changes in particular. You've probably driven past the Richmond Middle School and seen the solar tracker in the front yard. They've won various um, grants to help in, you know, in, in, um, install things like uh, water filtration systems and help to bring clean energy education into the schools. The high school is doing um, a whole range of other activities. Uh, the town itself is trying to lead by example. Um, and so, you know, the, com the Sustainable Hanover Committee also established in um, the earlier days prior to our vote uh, a green power purchasing cooperative for residents to be able to buy into green e-certified power. And this ran for a few years before, um, you know, circumstances led to us having to come back into our default utility service, but it isn't something that we've given up on. It's something that we're in the process of actually uh, reviving and, and trying for yet another go of it. Uh, we, it's unfair, the picture says in 2016, this actually happened in 2017, but we actually ran a, um, in 2016 a number of uh, residential solarized and weatherized programs to encourage people to solarize their homes or to weatherize because we all know that weatherization is, is really key, reducing the efficiency. We talked about the building stock and the need for um, updated building codes, et cetera, that help uh, you know, favor uh, a more efficient use of energy as well as the overall reduction. Uh, and it also increasing the, the number of solar photovoltaic cells that are installed you know, locally on rooftops, in yards, et cetera. So you can see some of the numbers, um, 2014 to 2015. Yolanda is the, the master at our data. And um, I'm pulling this a lot from her work. She'll, she'll recognize it. Um, but 75 photovoltaic systems installed up until 2015, and you know, another 66 just installed in the year and a half just after that. Uh, overall, uh, we generally aim to decrease our usage, I think, as most would feel is pretty intuitive. Uh, and then also, it's really important to increase, again, that renewable energy generation. And so, as you see on the, is it your left, the town's energy uh, electricity usage is declining overall uh, 8% in the last five years. And then we also see not only the increase in solar, but the increase of the size of the systems installed at the residential level. So these are the type of numbers that we like to see in terms of implementation. Um, 2017 is already a big year that I mentioned a few times. Uh, some of the things that um, followed this, this uh, commitment um, was the establishment of various task force. This was like that practical implementation component of how do we even internally self-organize to be able to wrap our heads around this community-wide initiative to, uh, to, to, to change our, our usage, to change the shape of our energy system? Um, a, a number of the committee, subcommittees and task force that were established um, as a result underneath of the energy subcommittee were focused on everything from looking at what our community-wide vision uh, for um, clean energy procurement and just what defines the values in our community were to the actual planning and self-organization to what are, the, what are the outreach needs that we have. You know, as I mentioned, we have institutional users uh, like Dartmouth. We also have large commercial, but we also have small business and then residential and then the town itself. So as we were thinking about how to implement this, we had to kind of think where do we put the committee's priorities. It's easy enough the town has uh, a number of initiatives going on, so we can assume the town will continue to do so. And then Dartmouth has a number of initiatives that um, they just had their forum an update on their plan that you, you probably heard about. Uh, so let's, let's continue the collaboration with Dartmouth and encouraging that, but they're on uh, the right trajectory and path as well and focus on that middle slice. Um, this past year, uh, we had our first annual forum and then just last week, I believe it was, we had our second annual forum. Um, everything, the more practical realities are things like adjusting your zoning, um, your, your codes and your zoning ordinances. We uh, pushed forward to a, a modification for our zoning ordinance to allow for solar. That was a really important step for us. Um, we also hired a consultant to help, us advi help advise us on some of the procurement strategies and best practices that were across the states. Who, what were other states that were doing this? What are the communities that can help guide our actions? And then also looking at um, within the municipal kind of construct, what can we do to host something that provides value to the broader community? So in reality, as I mentioned a few times, 
Um, what we came back to center on is, is really our community values dictating our green energy procurement um, strategies. And we thought this seemed like a really obvious place to start. Um, but as we've talked to other cities and other communities, and when I say other cities and other communities, I mean within New Hampshire, but I also mean like Denver and LA and San Diego. I mean, other like big cities, Atlanta, Toronto, who have made these types of commitments. This isn't actually always um, the first step. And so it was really uh, insightful to us that uh, it really helped us organize like where we started. And not every city had done this. Um, it's also helped us prioritize where we focus our time and in within which of those uh, sort of um, subsectors, if you will. And you know, these are some of the pictures. Abby will recognize uh, some of the Dartmouth solar installations. There's a solar install on the top of uh, the police department. Um, so one of our primary goals is how much renewables can we put locally and how can we uh, generate as many green electrons as close to where they're consumed as possible. One portion of that is in encouraging our large users, our residents, um, anyone who has the capacity to accept it, uh, to install solar, and what can we do on municipal facilities. Um, second is if we can't install it on the rooftop or in the yard, where can we put it within the town of Hanover's boundaries to generate more renewable um, electrons you know, kind of within our town confines. If we can't go there, let's look to neighboring cities, contiguous or non-contiguous. And then moving from that, how do we actually organize for those who can't put it on their homes or on their businesses to be able to buy into green electrons, so an actual cooperative. Um, all else fails, we'd like to build something within the ISO region, so keeping it within New England. You see uh, a picture of um, actually, the intentionality around the Vineyard Wind Project, looking at offshore wind in New England. Um, and then last resort, how do we go out to the national system of green electrons being created in the Midwest or in the Southeast or wherever? Lastly, one of the biggest areas that um, actually Clean Energy New Hampshire has been working on and something that's really important to us. Um, hold on. I don't show it. Uh, let me go back here. So in that 2018 picture, it's really tiny, but that's our director of planning and zoning. He's actually looking at one of our residential maps of solar installations in Hanover. This has been something, and we'll talk about it, I think, a little later, but about um, some of the data access and reporting and how you actually arrive at your targets, but then how do you measure them over time? And one of the biggest um, areas that Clean Energy New Hampshire has been working towards, and we're borrowing from the likes of our neighbors in Vermont who have also a beautiful Vermont community energy dashboard, is how do, you, um, how do you help lower the barriers to implementation for businesses, um, solar developers, residents? How do you provide some, some like low barrier to entry access to, to um, helping to encourage the deployment of, of renewables? And in this case, it's where are installations occurring? One of the important things is just mapping the infrastructure. Where is it? Where is there a need? Where is there capacity for it that's unmet? Um, and then how do we measure that over time? And so I think one of the things that um, Henry will likely talk about at some point is just having a snapshot, accurate data within the state of New Hampshire and then sub-state uh, for each municipality or local community to say, here's kind of what we have or the capacity to host and hey, by the way, we're really interested in doing so. How do we attract those, uh, those companies or those entities to come and do business in our, in our municipality? Um, and so kind of raising that hand to say this is something that we're really interested in, we have a commitment, and actually we'd like to move towards that, that implementation. And one of the biggest things is, is helping to lower that barrier. There isn't really good data for this part of the country, and it's a consistent challenge for municipalities to help encourage um, lower price bidders for renewable development in this area um, as a result. So I'll pause there. Great. Thank you. Henry. I was remiss, uh, I think, earlier in, in not specifically thanking Elizabeth Wilson, who, who had to leave to get to another meeting, who, of course, is the executive director of the Irving Institute for Energy and Society and uh, is just doing such a great job of bringing uh, vitality to the set of issues here uh, at Dartmouth. So with, with that, Henry. So I'm going to be very brief because I'm excited to get to the discussion, question and answer part of this. I know there's a lot of um, high level of knowledge in the audience, so excited to talk about that. I'm going to sort of 
A April, you landed on a lot of the points that I was going to land on, so I'm just going to kind of reiterate a little bit of that and um, then move us into that discussion section. So one of the reasons I love my job is because I get to visit with all of the energy committees and energy implementers down on the municipal level in the state of New Hampshire. And I think that New Hampshire has a really strong community and culture around civic engagement in your local community and volunteer, either, either whether it's the selectmen and the municipal staff or whether it's energy committees around the state that are really working on these issues, putting solar on the municipal facilities, weatherizing municipal buildings, doing public outreach and education, those weatherized, solarized campaigns that I know a lot of you have been involved in and are familiar with. <clears throat> it's happening here in Hanover. It's happening regionally through the strong community of regional energy committees supported by vital communities here in the Upper Valley. That's really a model for a lot of the state, but it is happening across the state in a lot of ways. So Kearsarge has been very active this past uh, year doing weatherized and solarized campaigns, educating their neighbors about how to become more energy efficient and how to adopt distributed generation solar. Monadnock, Monadnock Energy Hub has been very active. The Seacoast has a very strong community of energy committees as well. And you see it everywhere across the state, southern New Hampshire, the North Country, wherever you go, there are active, involved energy committees implementing solutions on the ground. And it's, it's really inspiring part of the work that I do that I get to engage with those local energy leaders and see the great work that is happening every day. <clears throat> so it's something that makes me proud of New Hampshire. Um, and it's, it's powerful to see that level of dedicated local leadership. I think what's key is finding the avenues to take that local leadership and to translate it into state policy leadership as well. So we've learned that there has been a lot of leadership at the state level in terms of implementing energy solutions and reducing energy costs and becoming more efficient and going to renewables in certain situations. But there's more we could be doing in terms of policy. And I think translating local leadership, local energy committees, the, de the, the vast amount of demand at the local level for clean energy solutions into state level policy leadership is a really critical piece. There are a lot of bills this session, and we're not going to go into detail about all of them, but just as sort of a primer, there's a lot of clean energy related policy and a lot of good bills, more so than I understand in past years. Um, expanding our net metering rules, strengthening our renewable portfolio standard in a number of different ways, bolstering our funding for energy efficiency, and then a lot of um, sort of other category, energy storage, municipal aggregation, customer data is a really important issue that uh, April was getting at as well. And these are a lot of opportunities, some of which we can, some of which are likely to become law, some may not. Um, but I think there's a sort of a powerful opportunity to harness the momentum of local leadership on clean energy and translate that into statewide leadership through statewide policy. <clears throat> so I'm going to pause there and, and open it up for discussion because I know there's a lot, of, a lot of smart folks in the room who are working in energy one way or another. And we can chat about policy. We can chat about any of the things we've talked about here tonight. Um, but I know there's a lot of activity in Lebanon, in Hanover, in, in the Upper Valley in general, in terms of local energy solutions and clean energy. And I'm um, curious to hear, hear the issues that you're grappling with now. What are, what are your sort of priorities that you're working on in your profession at the local level as an individual looking at what can I do personally for my home um, and thinking towards um, what can Clean Energy New Hampshire do to help support the work that all of you are doing either locally or in terms of removing some of these state level barriers addressing regulatory or, or legislative policy issues that um, can help facilitate the work that all of you are doing on the ground. Henry, thank you. We have a, we have a, a question coming up front and uh, Kristen, you're gonna, Kristen and, and Lexa both have, uh, have microphones and they will bring them around to you right here. Yeah, I want to ask about the state legislation that you had on your list um, and any opinions on the likelihood of that moving ahead and what that will mean for the state? Is there a specific piece of legislation you're asking about or just the legislation generally? Yeah, the this, this list energy here? efficiency, the net metering, et cetera. Sure. Henry? So I think there will a mix of these will become law and a mix of them will not. Um, 
there's some bipartisanship for some bills. There's a lot of partisanship where just one party supports an issue and de facto the other party wants to <coughs> oppose it. So you do get some of that, which is discouraging. But um, I think it's possible that we'll have some bolstering of energy efficiency funding. I think it's possible that there will, in terms of net metering, I think it's possible that we will expand the size allowed for net metering projects from one megawatt to five megawatts. Um, that that bill passed. That bill in particular passed with 24 of 24 senators voting for it, and with strong bipartisanship in the House. So that bill, um, I think 72% of the House voted for expanding that net metering, net metering under that bill. So there's promise there. Um, veto proof any? Those that bill in particular was veto proof. The, the challenge, of course, with the New Hampshire legislature, particularly the House, is given how large it is, if there's going to be a, a veto override vote, is who actually shows up to vote on, on that particular day. Uh, and, and so there's, uh, there's always a head counting process that, that goes on. Uh, and in fact, uh, this past year, uh, or past session, if I'm recalling correctly, one, one bill involving, uh, it may have been net metering, in fact, lost by one vote or a handful of votes. Uh, in, in, the, uh, in the veto override process. A, a similar bill lost by a handful of votes in the, in the veto override process last year. And another, vote, another bill relating to biomass energy, the veto was overridden by one vote. So, so I, I, I always told folks that, that I viewed uh, the New Hampshire political process as being a contact sport. Uh, in, in other words, I don't know, it wouldn't surprise me if there were a state legislator, or at least we know there's a former state legislator in the room, uh, one of every 3,000 people in the state is a state legislator, basically. Uh, and, and, and so your chances of being there with a the state legislator are pretty high at any particular moment. But this is an arena in which it really is important to get to know your state legislator and make sure they know your thoughts. Gen this gentleman here has a question or a thought. I'm curious. May not be on? Ah, better. I'm curious why, if this has such a broad support in the legislature, the executive is is vetoing these on a regular basis. It, do, do we know the politics around that? I, it, it's a it, it's a curious phenomenon. It seems like. Or is that <laughs> Henry? Do you want to jump in on that one? I'm going to pass on. Not, that. Not <laughs> okay. Thank you. I will, I will offer some, some, some careful observations here. Uh, there's, there's a real concern in this arena that whatever we do does not result in increasing rates to people. Right. That we don't, we don't push up rates, especially on those who are least in a position to be able to afford increased costs. And, and part of the challenge in the discussion around the net metering issue has been Exa uh, around exa exactly this point of is a net metering process one that effectively results in uh, a subsidization going on in which some would argue that those who are least able to afford a higher rate may be subsidizing those who could afford a higher rate. Uh, I think there are very strenuous efforts being made, A, to point out that that maybe isn't what's happening, but also to ensure that the way programs get structured, that, that would not happen. In fact, if you listen to our current, current governor, Governor, governor Sununu, who, who, who has not been uh, fully supportive of these efforts, he has said that his big concern is that, that we need to make sure if we're putting more money into renewables and, and solar projects in particular, that we're doing those projects in ways that really provide energy and reduce costs to those who, who are lowest on the economic ladder. Uh, and, and I think there's real sensitivity to that issue and real efforts to try to address that. So that's, that's one of the policy issues that, that underlies some of the opposition that's, that's out there. Yeah. I have a question here. Yeah, so I wondered if the panel could speak a little to the Public Utilities Commission, the role that it plays, the makeup of it, and its influence in the future of advancing sustainable energy in the state. Henry, do you want to start with that one? I would, I would be very pleased to. Um, so before I joined Clean Energy New Hampshire, I was a graduate student at the University of New Hampshire doing a master's that was focused on New Hampshire's Public Utility Commission. So I spent a lot of time there thinking in academic frameworks about what's going on in, in this regulatory agency. 
Um, so it's critical, critical institution, and it is rooted in this same sort of 20th century or perhaps even 18th century <laughs> roots that the, skipped a century. the or 19th century. <laughs> Excuse me, not that old. Um, <clears throat> same sort of roots in history as the utility industry, and it's it's had one role for throughout its existence, and that's set rates for monopoly utilities. That's our job. Set a fair price, not too high, not too low, fair for the shareholders, fair for the energy consumer, and that's been its job. And now all of a sudden, we're having all these new disrupt, all this new dis disruption in the energy sector, competitive actors, net metering, solar companies, putting you know, distribu distributed generation systems across the grid and feeding it in, and we have all these new policy questions about net metering, about costs, about how do we evolve our electricity system to become more decentralized, more competitive. And the Public Utility Commission has to grapple with those questions. But that's not really what it was designed to do, and that's not really what its role has been. So I think it's particularly challenging for the institution. And part of, I think, the opportunity, and this may be too, too much wish, wishful thinking, but I think Clean Energy New Hampshire has become more and more active in that arena, as have other actors. And I think bringing more voices into the Public Utility Commission in terms of communities engaging on data issues or engaging on here's what we want in terms of a distributed energy system, in terms, in terms of a modern grid, in terms of electric grid modernization, there's a lot of potential there. And I think Lebanon is one example that's been a big leader in terms of engaging the Public Utility Commission. But I absolutely think that <clears throat> there's a need for lead, the leadership within that agency where it needs to become, rather than a reactive body that says, OK, the utility wants to raise rates. Let's have a process to figure out what the rates should be. It needs to become proactive in thinking about what are the forward-thinking steps we can take as an institution to modernize the electric grid, to clear the way for these distributed energy resources that have vast potential to benefit the individual customer, but also benefit all ratepayers by bringing down those overall, that overall electricity load and that overall peak cost driver. So there's opportunity there, but it's really challenging because it's wrapped up in this sort of age-old, archaic uh, structure. I just want to add one quick observation on top of that, something that I uh, experienced in my time, which is that there is a growing awareness that, that you can't think of energy as an isolated issue, that you really need to think of it in the context of environmental issues and economic issues. And I would point to the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, which showed up on one of our slides earlier, as a really, really good example of ways that, that we are now, as, as a society and through our policies, bringing these different perspectives together. Uh, in fact, I, I, I can't help but look out at Cliff here in the audience because I recall many times that he, as a public utilities commissioner, and I, as a state environmental agency head, traveled together to meetings to, to meet with other public utility commissioners and environmental heads from, from states across New England and the Northeast to talk about how we were going to structure a program and operate a program that allowed us both to... Uh, basically ultimately reduce energy costs or at least uh, en generate energy in a cleaner way and at the same time, as I say, get that environmental benefit also. Uh, it, was a, it was a new way of looking at the world for the PUC commissioners. It was a new way of looking at the world for the environmental commissioners. We had to learn the world of energy. They had to learn the world of environment. Uh, those conversations weren't happening before, but they're happening now regularly here in New England and increasingly in other parts of the country as well. So just getting us out of our silos and seeing the interconnectivity of, of this much larger ecosystem is happening. It's taking time, but that's an important part of, of, of moving from, again, theory to, to practice and to reality. This gentleman here has a question. Oh, actually, I have a... I had an experience. I was the uh, chaired the um, weatherize program for Lyme, Orford, and Piermont last year. And I think while we had tremendous success in the number of homes we got to do projects, you know, in, in, in retro and Vital Communities was thoroughly uh, amazed by you know how how far we exceeded expectations. I think something that you mentioned really struck me and it really sort of hit me today, and that is that almost all the benefits of the weatherization in, in, the, in the three towns north of Hanover 
went to households who were fairly affluent to affluent. And the reason is because state policy says that ultimately the program that helped people out was a 50-50 sharing of, of project cost between the utilities and the homeowners. And my question is, how do we get state policy more aligned with the needs of the residents so those who need it most and can afford it at least can get any of the benefits. There were so few benefits going to the poorer households in any of the three communities. It was really, that was, that was our greatest disappointment. Uh, excuse, excuse me, a, a very real and very important challenge. Henry, did you want to share something on that from, from the municipal perspective? I can talk yeah, a little so bit about it, but. It's a great question. I don't have a good answer for you, but it's, I'm, does Tad have an answer? Uh, on bill financing. <laughs> well, does it? Pick up, a, pick, a, pick up a microphone, if you would. On-bill financing allows people to finance these in a cash flow positive way. So I think that is, I, I've heard of this challenge. This is not, it, it's, it, yeah, yeah, and, and I'm glad you're raising it. But I think finding, finding a way to communicate that to both the utility program administrators who run those programs, so then they can go back to their regulators and figure out, all right, we need to tweak these programs this way or that way to improve it for our residents. I think finding those clear communication pathways where we can articulate it and then communicate it to them so then they can make the fixes necessary because they want that, want that kind of feedback. Well, and I think that's where we're pushing um, for broader access to data. Uh, we have very, at least in our service territory, very arcane form of, of energy data reporting. And even the barrier to application is high. Uh, you have to have some level of awareness of even how to calculate your usage to be able to even think about qualifying. And in many low-income households, there's a moderation of energy usage and electricity usage because you simply can't afford to pay in the first place. And so if you can't sh show that that is an upside-down balance, um, you don't even qualify in the first place, which disadvantages low-income ho housing. Okay, a lot of low Can you just hold on just a moment? I want to get you a microphone there before you, before you speak so we can record this. Thank you. Yeah, it, it, interesting. I think I think a lot of the lower income houses didn't have any problem qualifying. In fact, but, but as you said, the data mm -hmm. the data issue was a problem, and, and I have to say there was a lot of made up yeah. data to try to figure out whether people were qualifying or not. But the issue was really the upfront costs. Yeah, the upfront costs I'd say is is another among issues. Um, the a third issue uh, related to cost is just availability of contractors. You know, the workforce in New Hampshire. Uh, needs to evolve, and the cost of that alone needs to come down. Uh, and so I think there's a lot of, there's probably a long list of, of points of feedback, I think, for how we can make these programs more effective. Yeah, I, I would just say very quickly on this, if you look at the, the climate action plan that, that, that I referenced earlier, one of the principal actions we identified was trying to get to a place where we were retrofitting 30,000 homes a year to achieve a 60% reduction in energy use. Mm -hmm. It's very doable, very achievable. The challenge is that upfront cost. Uh, Tad mentioned going to an on-bill financing system, which would be a, a great thing to do, but there is a lot of resistance from, for example, mortgage lenders that don't want somebody else who to have a priority over them should they need to foreclose. Uh, and so this is just one of many challenges that as a society, we have to figure out what's, what's most important and what's most valuable to us and how, how can we structure programs that will encourage that. I will say that there, that there are limited funds available for, for those um, uh, homeowners that, that are at the very low end of the, of the economic spectrum uh, through the uh, community action uh, programs across the state uh, to do uh, energy upgrades and, and energy efficiency work on homes. But, but there's just not nearly enough of, the, of that funding available. So this is, this is a very real challenge that as a society, uh, we've identified it, we know it's there, but we have not been able yet to move fully from the theory of what we know we should be doing to the, to the full implementation of it. You have a question. I think one of the problems that we're facing is that the banks don't seem to understand the simple return on investment of uh, subsidizing either a weatherization um, or a solar project. Uh, they tend to feel that there isn't any kind of uh, gain for them, whereas it seems quite peculiar to me if you're replacing somebody's 
utility bill with a solar ray payment that this doesn't come out in the wash. Um, but this does seem to be an issue. And part of the issue is, is that I understand that there's not a lot of good data on resale of homes yet in New England. So while California can prove that, yes, it is much more advantageous to have solar and you're going to get a payback on that, what you're finding is that in New England, yep, all we've got is data that shows that the house sells faster. Anybody want to, want to speak to that? No, I mean, this is an issue I think that is on our, our uh, coming up in town meeting, is that right, Julia? Um, related to excluding solar from home property tax, if I get that correct? Uh, assessments, yeah, um, because of that same question. And while the data hasn't proven yet that it's increased the, the sale price, um, that, it's, that it's indicating that the speed of the sale, uh, whether that's true, whether that's true across communities, I, I can't speak to that. Um, but I, I completely um, understand and empathize, and it's very similar to the weatherization conversation. But it's the same issue around um, the capital cost to install and then the ability to afford the 10 to 20 year payback and waiting for that return and that offset. Um, in addition to the fact that um, I think there's been an increase in local banks offering more creative, lower cost, lower interest financing. Um, but it, yeah, it does, you're doing this. It seems, um, from what I've seen too, hit, hit and miss depending on, on where you are and, and your ability to access that. Um, that's not to negate programs that are available at the state level for lower income housing or more equitable distribution. Um, but I think that's one of the primary challenges, not just unique to New Hampshire, but across the United States around equity in this clean energy trans transition. Uh, if you're going to speak again, I want to get a microphone back to you here if you have a, a further comment. And then we would come on over here. Okay. And I think the other uh, problem is, is that it is absolutely critical that we keep the homes that are solarizing on the grid. Because if they start to pull off as batteries become more effective, um, we're going to weaken the grid. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have an infrastructure uh, question. And thinking about the grid as being something that was so centralized for so long, uh, to what extent is the existing just transmission and uh, distribution infrastructure a challenge in bringing about this kind of transition to distributed and variable generation? So it's, it's the same technology that it's always been. So there's a lack of, you know, smart metering infrastructure, for example. Data, basically utility awareness of what's out there on the grid. So, we, so, it, so the utility can sort of see what are the distributed energy items out on our grid, what's doing what, where, and how can we sort of manage that. That is a huge challenge, I think, for the utilities, where they need to make investments to modernize their ability to integrate all of these new resources. And I think that we're, we're behind in terms of making those grid modernization investments. I think one of the practical realities is for technical capacity slash support for municipalities or decision makers who are trying to look at above a residential scale. So we have some solar developers in the room, but looking at how to even assess whether or not your community can host a larger system and what the opportunities for financing are or um, ownership of the kilowatts generated um, and how you can think about equitable distribution of those, whether it's on a private hosted site or, or not. Um, and one of the big issues around just understanding what the needs are for a larger renewable energy system like a solar array and you know, the need for three-phase power, the um, proximity to, to three-phase power, the cost, if not, to, to trench. What happens if you cross a state road versus you know, a non-state road? I mean, there's all these kind of practical constraints that come into play that change the financeability of some of the larger projects that would help municipalities uh, offset their, their consumption with clean energy. Um, I think in general terms, there are technical constraints that can be overcome, like smart metering infrastructure to allow for the two-way power flow, but the accounting system of that is also one that's sorely needed. And I think that's what Lebanon is experimenting with, with not only distributed generation, but around the metering of that infrastructure and how they're able to can, you know, generate on one house or, or one structure and, and maybe sell and, and mill, meter and bill um, to the other consuming you know, structure. Uh, and I, I think it's gonna be an exciting pilot um, 
for New Hampshire, but for the country to see what comes of this. There are, there are also, so there's geographies of the grid that are more or less uh, inclined towards accepting new distributed generation, right? Like maybe a part of the grid that is uh, it's at, out at the end of the line and it could stand to have a lot of uh, distributed generation on it. But there's no signal to the marketplace, no signal to the solar developer to say, hey, it's a valuable investment to put a lot of solar or solar plus storage here. So it gets back to the data issue of thinking, where do, we, where do we want this and where do we not want it? And how can we sort of make that clear to this competitive marketplace so then we can go and make those investments using solar, using energy storage? Thank you. Uh, yes, back here. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead and then we'll come over here. Um, I was wondering if um, in the beginning you showed the graph where it said New Hampshire was 21st in the rank. Um, I was wondering if anybody could speak to the fact that our, what our neighbors are doing that seems to be working a little bit better than we are in terms of either policy or, uh, you know, what, what is differentiating them from us. Um, and possibly is it the fact that maybe we need a green bank for to help with some of this funding issues? So that slide was referring to energy efficiency f uh, rankings. Okay. And um, yes, New Hampshire is behind some of our neighboring states. And I think it's, it's a product of the different, I mean, Massachusetts likes to sort of high, high taxes. We like to sort of be the first in all these kinds of things and make those big investments. So they have huge in investments in energy efficiency. And New Hampshire's priorities are elsewhere. New Hampshire's a little more conservative and cautious, I think. Um, so that's, that's a piece of it. Um, I, I will just offer a historical footnote here, which is that New Hampshire initially, with the funds it was receiving from the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, uh, Reggie proceeds from the allowance auctions, was investing the funds in renewable energy and, and, and energy efficiency projects. Uh, the legislature uh, expressed some displeasure with how they thought some of the money was, was, was flowing, how the monies were being managed, and initially took the control of that away from the PUC, but ultimately decided that they were going to essentially strip all of the money from going into grants and instead rebate the money to the ratepayers uh, on the theory that that, that was uh, the best deal for, for the ratepayers. Uh, if you look at what's going on in the other states, I think you would, you would see that, in fact, the relatively small amounts of money that are getting rebated to those individual ratepayers, if pooled, can in fact build some significant improvements in our, in our overall electrical system, uh, reduce the overall demand, especially at peak periods, and the consequence of that is actually it brings down costs for everybody because we don't have to build those peaking plants. So we made a conscious choice as a state to stop putting as much money into that, uh, in that direction. We have started to roll that back and now starting to put more money into the communities and now maybe starting to open that money up more again for reinvestment. Uh, but but um, that's a big difference in terms of how, why the other states have gotten so much farther ahead of New Hampshire. There are other policy choices we've made as well, but just how we chose to use those dollars uh, has, has been a, a piece of that. Uh, we have one more question, and then we're just going to do a, uh, a quick round of final comments. And then uh, I know that, that we'll probably all be happy to stay to chat further one-on-one, -on -one, but, but uh, we, we, need to be, we need to be true to everybody's dinner times at 6.45. Sir? I actually have a few questions. Um, well, I'm going to ask you to pick we'll, one. We'll pick one. <laughs> well, the easy one you probably haven't answered yet is you know, give us some context about the municipalities in the state. How many municipalities? How many have committees? How many are, have voted on 100%? The other one I thought was interesting was Eversource was like 10 times more net metering. Is that just customer-based, or are, they do, are there some other factors that are involved? My other question was about RECs and if there's a position on clean energy, New Hampshire, on spending money on renewable energy credits rather than just buying you know, renewable energy. So your first question, oh, yeah, that was a lot. Um, your first question, there are 234 cities and towns in New Hampshire, 70 to 80 of them have energy committees. And there's something like 70, about 70 municipal and school solar projects in the state, something like that. And um, five are 100 communities. Then the 100, yeah, five cities and towns have voted for 100% renewable energy goals. And, and there's about 10 or 12 
I think, that have explicit targets in other areas that are equally aggressive. Right. Right. Uh, and can you, I, can you, the, the question, the question was, um, Eversource's territory seems to have a much higher penetration of net metering. Is that just a function of the fact that it's uh, a larger, uh, just a larger uh, territory that they have, or is it because they're some, they're doing something different? Their net metering rules are not any different from Liberty's or Unitil's, so I don't know what the reason for that would be, aside from they have a much larger territory. Right. And Rex, renewable energy certificates will likely be a, a portion of the balance. It's, um, as we talked about earlier, the ways, the pathways to achieving 100, um, at least today, with some of the technical constraints, uh, will likely involve the purchasing of, of Rex as a portion of, of that portfolio. Um, the hope would be that we're generating again within our region, or we're able to cite it to a specific facility that we can think about additionality or subtractionality, however you'd like to think, um, you know, but are we building new facilities uh, of renewables and are we doing so where there's browner power that we're off placing or displacing as a result of our project? And so how can we use, use the municipality or many municipalities um, to be able to drive some of those projects? How can we partner with things like corporations or um, Boston was leading a big RFI to, to look at municipality, aggregating demand for municipalities across the country um, to be able to, to help get some of these projects over the finish line. Um, and so in that case, Rex may be a necessary part of the balance. For Hanover in particular, um, we hope that that is not the driving number one choice for us. Great. All right, we're each going to take 10 seconds. Last final thought. Some, something, something for people to think about as, as they're leaving the room today. I'll speak just really quickly to those folks uh, who are affiliated with the municipality here. There's, I know there's a handful of you, whether it's energy committee, staff, et cetera. Um, very eager to sort of expand Clean Energy New Hampshire's capacity to work with municipalities and support the work that you're doing, those who are taking part in the municipal membership and otherwise. So glad to have you here and looking forward to continuing to work with you. I'd say, um, especially for the students in the room, but this is one of the best times to be in energy. Uh, it's the most dynamic time. Uh, things are evolving and changing. Um, your voice matters as either a resident, a renter, a homeowner, um, just a, a person in your community. And I would highly, highly encourage you to get involved in things like uh, some of the committees we've mentioned or some of the boards within municipalities or to the extent that you can volunteer or uh, intern or, or you know provide some thought, knowledge, or leadership around um, your generation's desires for what this, this clean energy future looks like. Uh, so I'd highly encourage you to not think that your age precludes you from involvement, civic involvement. Uh, to the contrary, uh, it's encouraged. And so, you know, get out the vote and be active. <laughs> My final thought is that the future is going to be better than the past. And, and we really can, and we are making a difference. It's up to each and every one of us to live the way that, that, that we know we need to be living and to set the example and show not just ourselves, but our, but, but our family members uh, and, and our friends and our neighbors that, that there really is a better way to live out there uh, by living uh, in, a, in, a, in a world that's based on, on clean energy. Thank you all for joining us here today and please join me in thanking the panel.